The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining me today to talk about a really exciting topic in marketing, and especially in social media, and that is the concept of persona development. If this is one of those things that if you are really involved in social media or even involved in sort of the next level uh, of reaching customers, reaching donors, reaching prospects, reaching you know whoever it is that makes your organization tick, if you will, getting to that human level understanding of personas is, is probably one of the most important things we can do in understanding the consumer's buyer uh, decision journey, if you will, and uh, again, just getting some deeper insights. So everything we're going to cover today is, is really based on you know, how do we do that? What does that process look like? What are some of the things that we need to consider? That said, in our webinar does not make any of us into uh, you know, great persona development workshop facilitators uh, or you know, just uh, thinking we can do persona development from, uh, from an hour's worth of uh, instruction or insight, if you will. So uh, we'll definitely talk about some other resources here and uh, some other things you might want to consider as you uh, delve into persona development because uh, it's a very involved process and it is something that uh, you know organizations that do it take it pretty seriously and we'll share some stories of those here as uh, as we go. One of the questions that uh, everyone asks before we do a webinar is will we be able to get the slides and are you recording this? Absolutely, we are. Uh, those of you that have questions uh, as we go through this, you'll see the GoToWebinar toolbar on the right hand side of your screen. Feel free to ask questions in there. Uh, we did have quite a few questions submitted before the webinar when you guys registered, so we've tried to weave some of the answers to those questions into today's discussion. So what's the agenda? What are we going to get through today uh, between the next uh, next sort of 50, uh, 58 minutes or so that we have here? Uh, first and foremost, just want to talk a little bit about sort of the state of segmentation. How do we get to this concept of personas, why are we here, um, some of the benefits and, and the rationale for doing this, some of the key elements that make up a persona, a couple examples of them. And then we'll walk through uh, the, the steps in the persona process. And depending on who you read in the persona world, if you will, uh, you'll see that there are a number of different perspectives uh, to take on how to do personas. And the history of this really is uh, from you know, coming from the, the, the world of technology, uh, you know, way back uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, and there was a book written called the, uh, the Inmates Are Running the Asylum, and it talked about software usability, and uh, the, the concept of user personas was talked about in there, popularized in there. David Meerman Scott, in his book, The New Rules of Marketing PR, further popularized it for marketers and social media folks. And uh, that's kind of what's gotten us to where we're at today. Uh, so the audience, of course, is not flat. Is uh, is what do we mean by that? Well, at the end of the day, and, and I think most of you on the call would agree, demographics don't tell the whole story about an audience. Geographics don't tell the whole story. Even psychographics, sociographics, technographics, all these other terms and concepts we can use to get a better understanding of our audience really don't communicate who they are at the human level. And one of the things that we've talked about so far this year, and it was the subject of the last webinar for those of you that were there, was this concept of human social media. How do we get more human with our audience? Personas are one way to do that. And again, we're going to kind of walk through the, you know, the whole process today. Even if we, you know, go go partway through this process and get a better understanding of the human beings, you know, on the other end of the line, so to speak. You know, we're further along than those brands that are still communicating to the. Uh, you know, the sort of flat demographic. If you remember back to marketing, those of us that took marketing at sort of the 100 or 101 level, you'll remember the acronym STP, which was segmenting, targeting, and positioning. It had nothing to do with what Richard Petty was doing at the time. Uh, the old segmentation model said that, and not that old segmentation is bad or irrelevant or not still around at all, this is just a, a new twist on it, if you will, so that Marketing strategy was really, you know, designed to focus on segments that took target markets and, and, and uh, you know, sliced and diced them. What we see in social media and what we see in a networked economy is that those segments aren't just slices, 
but rather they're slices that share common interests, have access to one another through networks, and who look to one another as trusted resources and references through those networks. When you look at how business gets done, one of the key ways that business happens, if you will, is through the use of things like doing uh, word of mouth or you know other sharing tools or techniques uh, or even things uh, like Facebook. You know, Facebook is now what the second most trafficked word of mouth uh, you know tool out there, if you will. Segmentation matters in that we really still need to communicate to diverse audiences in their own language. But when we think about this network approach, this idea of having access to one another, having a means to communicate with one another, really changes you know, how we segment markets and, and thusly how we think about the personas that we're speaking to. Uh, when you think about the, uh, the Facebook friends of you or any of your friends, consider that the average millennial has between 475 and 760 depending on the study you look at, friends. Those really aren't friends. When they communicate something about a brand, that's an audience. And so we really need to think about you know, how, that, uh, how that audience uh, matters and how we communicate to them at a human level. Uh, the last bit on segmentation here, before we really dive into personas, the sort of cracks in segmentation, if you will. You know, why doesn't it work for us? Why are personas necessary? Segments are usually too broad, even though they're designed to be segments and, you know, subsets of, of the, the whole target. Uh, they're still typically too broad, and they're not enough to make a human connection. One of the key components of personas, and for those of you that are sort of taking notes and thinking, okay, what are the big highlights of personas? One of the big highlights of personas is that they allow us and give us an opportunity to express empathy for an audience. And, and feel empathy for an audience by really getting inside their processes, their buying behavior, the narrative in their life, how our product, service, or organization fits inside their life. Uh, it's, it's an opportunity for us to get inside the buyer's mind. Empathy isn't something that we have the capacity for in traditional sort of flat demographics and flat segmentation. The other thing that is really driving personas, especially in B2B. And what's funny is a lot of the persona work that, that we've seen uh, and, and interviewed folks about or been party to has been in the B2B space. Yes, certainly in B2C it's done all the time. Um, but in B2B we realize that it's still a human being making the decision. It's not just the monolithic enterprise. So let's get down to business and talk about what is a persona. Every author who's written about personas, and we'll, we have three key books, I think, that you guys will find useful at the end, and uh, there's some links to some other resources that we'll put online uh, in a blog post as a recap to, to this particular event. Uh, but it's a personalized extension of market segmentation. So it's taking that STP and giving it a human face. That's one, and I think uh, one great explanation of, of you know what a persona really is. It's just humanizing the buyer in, in a lot of ways. Detailed, fictional, and I always say quasi-fictional. This isn't, you know, it's fictional, but you know, everything we put into a persona is based on real events. It's based on real life. It's based on real interviews. It's based on real people. And what it isn't, obviously, is one real person. You know, it isn't an example of, hey, this is, you know, Johnny the whomever. Uh, it is, though, a representation of that archetype, you know, that, that group, if you will, um, that idealized version of, you know, that, that customer. Uh, Wikipedia simplifies it and says they're fictional characters created to represent different user types. And again, this is going back to, you know, the software origins of, of personas, the technology origins of personas uh, that have a certain attitude or behavior that might use site, brand, or now product in a similar way. So that's what we mean by personas. Uh, again, why? I think that's part of today, you know, all all webinar, we're going to come back to some of the whys. Uh, but I think personas are something that can be helpful for those of us that need to start executing better in social media today. Another big thing, in addition to empathy, is you know market segments don't buy products. People do. And so this is one of the things that when we talk to executives who say, well, this persona thing, I don't get it. Well, Market segments, what you have now, your go-to-market strategy, your core markets, all of those things, aren't the ones who are buying. It's still the people, if you will, who are buying. 
you know, when we think about this is something that uh, we picked up from Will Evans, who's, uh, who's written about customer experience and, and about uh, user insight and, and specifically the research required uh, that goes into that, the sort of customer BS to insights ratio. Uh, it doesn't take us a lot of information to get from, you know, total BS and knowing nothing to having some great insights. And, uh, you know, I like Will's approach here. Of, you'll notice the number of people. It's 12. That's it. You know, we're not talking huge numbers here. And personas, while they are involved, aren't things that, you know, require us to do massive, massive amounts of research. We'll talk about some of the research that's required and what we need to do in order to get to, uh, you know, an ideal, uh, ideal persona. What are some of the benefits? So for those of us that are still skeptical, well, why would we do this? You know, I don't get it. There are a few key things that those organizations that have gone before us in doing personas, they find that it gives them much better direction for keywords, content, social media content especially. Again, that's part of the reason why we're all here today is how do we leverage these for social and, and traditional marketing as well. But, you know, think about your own perspectives on products and services and what you use to search and then think about what your company might say something is you know we might call something XYZ widget and the industry may call it XYZ widget but the buyers of that product regardless of what industry they're from or buyers of that service may not call it that at all they may call it something completely different and so our challenge when we you know go to market thinking from the buyers perspective is you know what are they going to use to find us well what better way to understand how they think than to do some of this, you know, research, uh, you know, under the guise of personas. It brings focus for user-centered design, and I don't just mean design of products, design of websites. When we think about how do people access information, how do people think about what it is we do and understand who we are and how relevant we are to them, it also helps us, in, and we've seen in some cases, there's a story of a company, a B2B company, that uh, had noticed really a, a three-year dip in sales, just a, you know, a, a slow decline, and then in the third year, a more rapid decline, really for no reason. There wasn't any increased competition. They're, they're, they really didn't understand, and what they came to the, the conclusion of, they really didn't understand where the buyer was going. What's happening to these people? Why aren't they finding us? Why aren't they buying from us? So they embarked on a couple of initiatives. One of those initiatives was persona development, and at as they went through the process, what they found was that the buyer behavior had shifted, where they got information, who they trusted, sources. And this is sort of in the mid-2000s when blogs and Twitter and then Facebook and LinkedIn all became more powerful. And buyers had actually shifted to sourcing their information from those places and not from catalogs, trade publications, print, conferences, etc. And as they shifted their messaging, as they shifted their communication tools, they found you know, that resurgence in sales. But they wouldn't have found that had they not built those buyer personas, done the interviews, and really understood the wants, needs, goals, and behaviors uh, of those buyers. Uh, personas allow us to build stronger offers, better messaging, and calls to action and landing pages. There's another interesting story uh, about a group of salespeople that are involved in a, in a persona exercise, which, by the way, salespeople, if we have them uh, in our organization, uh, are some of the best folks to bring in to maybe not the core team of developers, which we'll talk about here uh, on the Persona project, but at least in the sort of ad hoc and advisory team, uh, because they were arguing about, you know, a type of buyer that they never liked dealing with. And what that led to was a, of course, different persona for that type of buyer. And in this particular case, a completely different line of messaging, a completely different approach to communication, because while that buyer was certainly not the most uh, friendly and comfortable to deal with, it was a very lucrative market. And through understanding that buyer persona, they were able to create much better messaging and much better go-to-market strategy to reach them uh, than they had, you know, in all the years prior trying to reach that particular segment. Uh, helped drive consensus in the organization and then really lead to greater understanding of how people want to use, whether it's a website or your product or what have you. And one of the questions we always ask, and this is an internal question, is you know, how does our product, how does our service fit into the lives of our, of our customers or constituents? And personas help us to figure that out. So some of you are probably wondering, well, what does one of these things look like? Uh, this is out of uh, one of the better books out there on, uh, on personas, The User is Always Right by Steve Mulder. 
And this is looking at the first time home buyer, which is actually very relevant for those of us in the real estate industry. Uh, and, and this is an archetype of that young family home buyer. Now there may be other personas, if you will, on a, you know, on a, on a home buyer uh, segment. But you know, if you look at some of the major features here, Francis, the first time home buyer. So we've given this persona a name. Every persona has a name. In this case, it's actually a, a couple. You know, this is the female of that couple, knowing that through the research, this organization found that she was the driving force in the decision. So our communication is going to be to her. We're also considering her relationship with family and friends and, of course, her spouse, uh, because Michelle in this case, uh, or sorry, Francis in this case, uh, is going to be the conduit. What are some of her specific goals? What are some of our business objectives that we want to achieve by better understanding her? And what's the narrative that she has in her personal profile? What are some of her quotes? What are some of the things that, and this is where we start to translate this into a sales role or even a customer service role, these are the common phrases that this type of person might say or common things they might be feeling that are you know, uttered through the, the buying process or through the service process, which help us to easily identify and, and sort of quickly home in on, oh, this is this type of persona. You know, these are the things I need to do. Some organizations go so far as to create almost like playing cards or baseball cards, if you will, of their personas in their organization because they want to understand and have everyone understand you know exactly who we're focused on and who we're working with. This is more of a B2B example that Vistaprint had created, our friend Patricia the Perfectionist. And you'll see with Patricia, uh, she actually is a business buyer. Again, business objectives, her goals and motivators, her profile, her technology profile, and all of those things that we need to know about her. And then again, some of the quotes and some of the things that really drive Patricia as a, uh, as a persona here. So a couple of questions. Uh, before we frequently ask questions about the process, before we get into, you know, how do we do personas? Because we uh, we don't want to spend too much time. You guys know what they are now. We understand some of the values. Let's get right down to uh, to the process. Uh, most organizations ask the question, "How many do I need?" We've seen projects, uh, no kidding, where an organization has created upwards of 50 personas. Um, it was it was a waste of $100,000, and it was a waste of a lot of time. Um, not really a good persona exercise. Uh, we cannot market to 66 different personas, especially uh, typically in one line of business. Most organizations settle on three or four. We've seen some do four to seven, more than seven, and our argument is you really haven't fully understood the user, haven't fully understood the customer. Um, how do I do personas? It's a big question. It isn't something that any one of us can unilaterally go back after a webinar like this and sit in a room and say, hey, I'm going to do personas you know, for my audience. Uh, it requires a core team. It requires qualitative insights, meaning we need to get face-to-face -face and toe-to-toe -to -toe with customers, users, and constituents to really understand them and ask some of those directed yet free-form questions. We'll talk about some of those questions, some of the things we want to understand here in a little bit. And then, of course, people ask, well, so I've gone through this exercise and created them. Well, what do I do with personas? Now what? Well, first and foremost, the best personas are ones that have some sort of executive buy-in. Marketing teams don't usually do these on a whim and say, well, we're going to try this and it's going to be a skunk works project. Personas are something that need to actually fit culturally within the organization and in really inform your strategy and inform your approach. It's not just looking at this as a customer profiling exercise. Personas are living documents as well. Personas are living concepts, just like your audience is you know, full of living human beings. Personas live as well, and they should be things that are subject to change over time as behavior changes over time. A couple of you know, do not do's in personas. Personas aren't just internal data. You need to get outside your four walls. You absolutely need to get out in the field in order to do these right. Yes, we can do low-level ones without getting out into the field. It also usually indicates an organization isn't you know, fully committed to the process. And frankly, for the level of persona that we typically need for social media, where we're thinking about personas under the, you know, sort of under the usage uh, directive of we want to better understand the human being on the other end of the you know the tweet or the other end of the Facebook post uh, you know any modicum of, uh, of persona work we do there tends to be better than what we have 
uh, for the purpose of social media. So we can break some of these rules if we're doing these just for the social media team. But then again, you know, why would we want to just do it for the social team? It should be part of the organization. Um, as much as we're going to share some templates and ideas, and you've seen a couple of templates uh, for the home buyer and, and of course, for Vistaprint, uh, that is also one of the things that hamstrings a lot of persona efforts is trying to template all of this. Yeah, there are some questions. Yeah, there's an approach. Yes, there's a process. Uh, but every company is going to be different. Every organization is different, nonprofit, for profit, and of course, every buyer is going to be different. And so we can't necessarily just jam these into a template, but we're, we're going to try a little bit today because it, it does help us frame things up. Um, we can't ignore primary research. We can't just use secondary data by any stretch. We can't use old data. Uh, you know, and, and it isn't something, again, we can do unilaterally. We need a team to make this effective. So where do we start? Um, like I mentioned in the, uh, in the agenda, we've got six key areas we're going to focus on today when we talk about building personas. And you know, we're going to weave in a lot of insights from you know, our experience, experience of others, and you know, the authors and uh, you know, persona uh, experts out there that, that do this stuff day in and day out, and, uh, and hopefully bring all of that to bear uh, for us this afternoon. Uh, first and foremost, personas again aren't done on, on our own. In in one of the uh, uh, the books on personas they call this the family planning stage which is bringing together the family if you will that's going to help create these personas and that's really key because you think about uh, having a coach to drive you, thinking about having the insights of a coworker to guide you, think about having the perspective of someone in the field to inform you know your work back at the office. Uh, this is something that we need a core team typically it's three to five folks Often there is one executive on this team. Uh, ideally, there's an executive on this team who's backing you up and who really believes in the value and benefits and the outcomes of this. And also including a much larger and, and equally well-informed advisory team. And this advisory team can come from anywhere in the enterprise. Now, if you're a small company, the advisory team is you yourself and you know your coworkers. Uh, in a lot of larger organizations, though, the advisory team will include someone from customer service, HR, research and development, engineering, design, sales. Certainly, sales. We need that frontline perspective. Dealerships, second, third party distributors. Uh, you know, second and third uh, tier distribution. Sorry, uh, anyone that has customer contact, we want to be in there. Uh, we need to understand what problems we're trying to solve. What is it that personas are trying to do for us? We need to do some research within our own organization first, as we're going to develop some ad hoc personas here shortly. Uh, and we need to understand what we know and what oh, sorry, what we know and what we don't know, uh, and really cataloging those things. What do we know about our customers? What do we think we know about them? And what do we absolutely not know at all? And then we create the plan and work on some of the next steps. Questions we want to ask ourselves about our customers as we start to develop the first phase of personas, which are called the ad hoc persona. Geographic limitations. Are they here? Are they in 16 states? Are they nationwide? Are they worldwide? Primary demographics. You know, we're not trying to boil the ocean here. We do need to narrow this down a little bit. What are some of the segments that we're trying to attract? Do we have male or female buyers? What is their buying power if they're an enterprise? What is their income if we're talking B2C? Some of their titles. And this is where it gets interesting because, you know, the titles may not really be the titles that we think of early on. There are plenty of stories of organizations who said, oh, we need to right, go right to the top. We need to go to the CEO, the COO, the CIO, the CFO, the C whatever, only to go through the persona process and find out that, well, that's probably the person that ultimately signs the check. They are far from the focus of dissatisfaction or the focus of support or the focus of power or the focus of influence or any other focal point in an organization that actually contributes to a sale happening. So the titles are, are some of the things that we really, really find interesting in this process because that's where we see some, some wide divergence from what we really think is going on out there and what is really going on with the reality is. Their decision-making role and authority. Another hot topic this year, uh, and it has been for a few years, uh, the uh, Corporate Executive Board, IBM, McKinsey, and others have jumped on this 
And that's really understanding the decision journey of our buyer. And the persona is designed to also influence our understanding about the decision journey. Where do they go for information? What steps do they take? What's their thinking, uh, you know, habit? What's their thought process? What's their, you know, what are the things that they're doing? What are the activities in this, in this process, in this journey from I don't know you to now I know you, now I like you, now I trust you, now I'm going to buy from you. Uh, who are most powerful and active users, active customers, power donors, biggest influencers? Uh, and then, of course, key customers, uh, key prospects, sorry, and non-customers. We may find those through LinkedIn. We may find those through industry or trade groups. Uh, but we need to understand where they are as well. So once we've assembled the team and we understand some of the key questions that we want to ask, now we move into essentially the qualitative research gathering phase of, of understanding uh, you know what we need to about personas. This is where we assemble the team and then assemble the data. So a couple things to think about as we move into here, and uh, this is uh, fairly involved as we talk about the interview and some of the things that really make for rich persona data. Uh, without which, we really can't, you know, achieve the the, the greatness that personas are uh, are capable of, if you will. First and foremost, existing primary data sources. What do we have internally about our customers? What do you have externally? Industry reports, competitive analysis, anything like that. This is where we're looking at anything we have on demographics. Most of us will have that. Maybe we've done some psychographic research to sort of get inside their heads a little bit. Maybe we understand a little bit about their behavioral. Uh, maybe that's some secondary research or some third-party research from within the industry. Uh, certainly, sociographics, what are their social networks, what does their connectedness look like in the industry? And then finally, because it's such an important factor, the technographics, what is their usage of technology, what tools, what platforms are they on, how do they communicate, how do they source information? Uh, and that then leads us into the customer interview. Good personas are never done with data alone. What we end up with doing them by flat data alone is basically a spreadsheet. It's hard to humanize a spreadsheet. It's hard to humanize the customer without actually getting toe-to-toe -to -toe and face-to-face -face with customers. Do we need to do a thousand interviews? Absolutely not. If you remember back to the, uh, the earlier post about you know BS versus insights, when you look at all the research on, say, web usability, for example, how many users does it take to really get a very good 90% accurate assessment of the usability of a website? Believe it or not, it's only about six. With personas and customer interviews, you know, we're not talking about going out, sending research teams to develop, you know, 100 interviews. We're talking about a couple dozen, typically. Um, Cross-section of existing customers. And we try to interview them in their context. We want to see what's on the desk. We want to see what's on the wall. We want to see what's going on. We want them to be comfortable. It's even better, if, in, if possible, if we can interview them in pairs because then we've got some dialogue going on. It's not that intimidating, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, sort of uh, late-night TV interview that you might see when they're trying to, you know, get someone in a gotcha moment on CNBC or C-SPAN or something like that. Uh, and then, you know, the qualitative and experiential, experiential again, qualitative, asking the questions, getting the free form answers, and experiential, really experiencing their environment with them, um, is, is the foundation of, of making great personas. So one of the questions that we're always asked is, well, so what would we ask people? You know, what do we want to know from them? What do we want to understand from them? What's, what, what do we do in an interview? I mean, why can't we just do a survey? Why can't we just, you know, do a phone call? Yeah, we can. Again, there's different levels. Certainly, we can do surveys. Certainly, we can do phone interviews. Again, the best form is really getting person to person. A uh, couple things. We want to understand a day in the life. We want to understand how our product fits, how other products fit, how other services fit. We want to understand if we're a nonprofit, you know, why do they do what they do? What's the why behind their day? What's the why behind their, you know, why they donate? We want to understand how they make decisions. What sources do they use? What influences them? We want to understand what their pain points are. You know, what's frustrating? And these are some of the things, again, that we'll get through the open-ended questions. We'll, we'll talk about some of those open-ended questions that we ask in persona development in a little bit. 
You want to understand what they value. What are their goals? You noticed in the first two persona examples, for the home buyer and for Vistaprint, that in both of those, we understood their specific goals as it related to our product or service or category of business. That is easily one of the most important things to get out of the customer interview is understanding their goals, meaning what are they trying to achieve? What's the end game here? You know, and how do we play in that whole process? Where do they find information? What experiences are they seeking? And any objections? You know, what are some of the things that frustrate them and challenge them and so on and so forth? You know, how do we really understand uh, what's going on in their head, if you will? These are the things that we want to understand. So, again, if you look back for a second, these are some of the things we want to know from them. These are things that we want to really pull out of them in this process. These are the things that an organization is typically asking themselves as they're going through this interview or asking themselves as they're analyzing the data for these personas. What's their unspoken question? You know, what are the things that they maybe acted on but didn't say? What are the things they alluded to but didn't really express? you know, verbally or verbatim. Uh, what does this person expect from our product or service or organization? We want to understand what their experience is with the organization. Have we met? Have we fell short? You know, where are the competitors? You know, some organizations that have done, there's a story of an organization that ha had been doing persona work, and they had really had a tough time um, reaching a, a new market. Um, a new market meaning a, a segment they were trying to reach. Uh, for, you know, they had added some features to a product and thought, you know, this is going to be an ideal product to bring to uh, to this market. And they were having a really tough time selling in that market. And what they did is go out, of course, and do some of the persona work. And they found that the experience of these interviewees with the competitor was the competitor did X, Y, Z in order to really help them understand their business, help them understand the situation, what sort of system they needed. And this company had, in the past, never needed to do that kind of analysis because they were dealing with a different level of decision maker. So what they found was that the experience fell short, the expectations weren't met, and how this organization fit into the life of the buyer, if you go back to one of the questions earlier, uh, it wasn't fitting into the life of the buyer. It wasn't fitting into their decision journey because their decision journey included a couple, three steps that this organization had failed to do. Once they understood that, sales took off. The personas were written uh, so that they understood exactly how to speak to this buyer, exactly what information to create and information to collect and, and collateral to leverage and so on and so forth. Uh, we want to understand if this person collects information quickly, if they make decisions quickly, if they make them slowly. For example, do we need to do a lot of demos and webinars or do we need to do white papers and blog posts and other things that might um, be more of a slow burn approach? what motivates this person. They may or may not express their motivation, but what do we understand their motivation to be? What are some of the inflection points that we can gather about when they take action? So the customer interview. We typically do them one at a time. We like to pair because it gets a dialogue going and it's much, much less confrontational if there are two of them and one of us. Uh, you know, we introduce ourselves, we always record because even if we thought we took great notes and asked great questions, we absolutely never capture everything in our notes and never remember everything after an interview. The best way to do this is through open-ended questions. We'll talk about some of those in a minute. We want to understand the problem that we're trying to solve. Again, back to our goal about personas. Is it a problem they see? Is it a problem that we see? We tend to listen more than talk, uh, just like you guys are doing with the webinar today. Uh, really understanding, you know, we are not there to sell, we are not there to promote, we are not there to persuade, we are there to absolutely learn. What we also want to do is understand, you know, when are they sort of narrating behavior, when are they sort of narrating their life, when are they sort of just editorializing, and when are they expressing what they actually do. And that's what we really want to get to here is understanding behavior, understanding mindset, not just understanding, you know, the story. Uh, empathizing is, again, something that comes up. We talked about empathizing before. We do want to understand their context. When and where and how do they make decisions? 
And we always look at this from the perspective of, you know what, we're going to go in there knowing nothing. We're going to go in there assuming that we're not very smart about what they're doing. I'm not saying we're not all smart. But we're, we don't understand everything that needs to be understood about this customer, about this organization, about their behavior. So assume that what we think and what we know uh, or think we know is actually wrong in this case. What we're looking to gather, uh, and you saw this through some of the questions just a moment ago, we want facts, we want behavior, we want an understanding of pain, the so-called, you know, what keeps you up at night question, which by the way is not a very good question to ask, uh, but uh, there are other ways to get at pain points. And we certainly want to understand, in fact, if not most importantly, their goals and, and how does, again, our service product, whatever we offer, meet their goals. We also, if possible, and this is where some real fun sort of ethnography comes in, if you will, we want to understand their environment. You know, is there an opportunity to videotape them doing what they do? Is there an opportunity to, to you know, just get some, some photos of their desk, their workspace, their factory, their whatever, their home, you know, whatever we're doing here, uh, whatever we're trying to understand, because we want to really, again, build this persona that, that makes them into as real a human being as possible. And the more visuals we have to do that, the better off we are in trying to translate that to the team and ultimately, you know, building up the complete profile or the complete persona, uh, you know, of that archetype individual, if you will. Uh, this goes back to uh, not persona development per se, but, you know, there's the story out there, of course, of how the uh, Swiffer, uh, those of you that use the little, you know, Swiffer cleaner, and how that was developed. Uh, P&G had actually gone out and uh, hired uh, a number of folks to do some ethnographic research. And what they found was that after sweeping, um, you know, most people in their homes were actually, or many people, not most, but many people in their homes were actually wetting a towel and then running it along the floor to collect the last bits of dust that the, uh, that the broom wouldn't catch. And what they learned from that was this is a behavior that it's almost second nature. It's something that, you know, in the interviews, it never came up as a need whether implied or expressed, it just never came up at all. And only through photos and videos and really journaling, you know, behavior, did they find out that this need for, you know, a complete uh, cleaning solution that picked up dust and all without having to do the extra step of, you know, wetting the towel and running along the, the tile or wood floor, uh, you know, that, that they didn't have that insight until they did that, uh, you know, that, that visual research. So consider how that might affect uh, your work as you're building these, uh, these personas. So things to do during the interview. Uh, you know, we absolutely don't want to, and there's a lot of things we can do. We've talked about those. Uh, one of the things that we see interviewers doing sometimes is asking leading questions. Um, leading questions as in, you know, we want to get to a desired state. We even see this in, in junior survey writers where, you know, they ask about something that almost leads down an inevitable path to a conclusion that is already sort of a priori set up in their mind. That's what they want people to answer. And we need to pull back from that. You know, we're there to just be sponges. We're not there to take people down a, down a specific path, uh, you know, toward our product or toward our competitors or away from competitors. Uh, we also don't want to get them speculating too much because, this goes back to the old adage about if Henry Ford had asked people what they wanted, they would have said at the time, a faster horse. Of course, they, uh, they didn't get a faster horse, they got the car. Uh, have he, had he asked about the future and really done research about the future, we would have found that we're not really going anywhere with this faster horse concept because we're going to the horseless carriage concept. Uh, how do we start this conversation out? So what we'll ask people are things like, tell me about this. So how do you do this? Uh, what do you think about X? Uh, we're not quite clear. We ask them to elaborate. We love examples. We love to understand specific use cases because remember use cases go beyond narrative and get at direct behavior that they're exhibiting or have exhibited. Uh, we look for things that they do when they've done them. Tell me the last time you want to do this. How did you do it? You know, what process did you take? You know, what sort of thoughts did you have? At the end of the day, this is really where the data gathering sort of comes to a head. We've gotten our primary research from the field now. We have the secondary research. 
from the industry, we have any primary data from within our organization, and we don't want to necessarily go back and start boiling the ocean on all this data, we've got some great insights. So what we do with these insights is we come back together as a core team, and truth be told, this can actually be done before the data collection or after the data collection from the field, uh, but in, in the process that we generally use, uh, we like to actually go out into the field first and do some interviews and talk to people first uh, before coming back in and doing the ad hoc personas. So putting together the core team, you know, this is a, a, a picture of what the core team typically does, uh, you know, as we look at some of the, the fundamental questions from the persona template, which we'll see here in a few minutes, um, we try to build a skeleton or a few skeletons. This is, we're going to have more of these than we are actual personas at the end of the day, but processing the data, coming up with a series of skeletons that we create in order to just start to frame up who these users, who these customers are. This is where we start to give them a personality and a name as well. And, and the way we think of it is, you know, it, uh, there's the words that you hear in a movie are all in the script already, right? They're all part of the script. It's a flat script. But it's not until that script is read by a real actor, by a real person who really personifies and embodies and totally expresses the ideal of that role, uh, does that persona, does that concept, does that plot really come to life? You know, and so what we want to really start to do here is, is bring as many lifelike details as possible. And the reason that we like to have the interviews done at this stage is because we can say, oh, you know what, this person's environment is X, or they work in a cube, or they're in a huge office, or they're on the factory floor, or they can't hear anything, or they can't talk, so don't call them, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, you know, we look at their environment. We look at, you know, what it is that makes, you know, for a more lifelike situation. Uh, we also look at customer categories. So are they business to business, business to consumer? Are they small to medium business? What line of work are they in? And this is where we might have anywhere up of, you know, 20, 30 different, you know, categories that we serve. You know, small to medium business, great. Maybe we serve restaurants and we serve delis and we serve small retail shops and so on and so forth. And it, we look at those categories and amass them to make sure that we haven't missed anyone. But then our goal here is really, as we start to build the ad hoc personas or the skeletons, to start to chunk those together, start to narrow the road here a bit on each of these personas. Once we've gotten the ad hoc groupings together, and if you, uh, a little while ago we had showed uh, the slide of a few guys around the table, and they were staring at a big, uh, you know, whiteboard with a bunch of groupings of these uh, little post-it notes. That's, those are the skeletons right there. Uh, and then we take those skeletons and we bring the team back together, and we start to deliberate about the skeletons and refining them. You know, we look at their behavior. We look at some of their history. Uh, we keep them focused on the buyer goals. So by this time, we've also looked at, you know, what are the what are the goals that each of these buyers has, and we categorize them. So this is where the spreadsheets do come in handy. You know, as we've done the interviews, as we've done um, the secondary research, as we've asked the salespeople, you know, we've used our advisors. We come up with a series of buyer goals and then cluster them to say, well. Now, these buyers all have the same goal, this set of buyers have the same goal, et cetera, et cetera. And we start to bring these skeletons into clusters or personas of no more than seven. Most organizations actually settle on three or four. It's, and when we think about this for the development of social media content, and let's bring this back to the core of why we're here, it's really difficult to write for seven different human beings on your blog on your Facebook page, through Twitter, or any social channels, even white papers or webinars or anything that you're doing, it's really difficult to communicate to seven completely different personas about the same thing. Now, I get it if you have different lines of business, different service offerings, different, you know, you know, completely different uh, brands, that's a totally different story. We're talking about, you know, a discreteness of audience and discreteness of, of offering and clustering them together so that we have really just a few personas. Uh, that we're going to market to and communicate to. Then we get into actually creating the persona. You know, this is one example here. 
of, uh, you know, these guys called this person Chuck the Casual Web Surfer, and we looked at a little bit about Chuck. Um, actually, we didn't. This is another organization that uh, did the work here. Um, you know, the, their role, their type, you know, a quick sketch or a quick picture of that person, you know, some context. How does he work? Where does he work? You know, what is he doing when he's at work or in his organization or at home? Uh, again, based on context. What are some of the goals he has? What are the goals that we have for him? And what are the implications of the interplay of his goals and our goals and then thusly how we actually communicate uh, and, and market to and, and write and in this case of websites designed for him, create information architecture that he can actually find the information he wants. So we try to articulate the role. We articulate their goals. We really, through the narrative process, which isn't actually shown on, on this particular visual, we try to give them a voice. And you saw those narratives early on in the first time home buyer and in the uh, Patricia the Perfectionist. We absolutely give them a name. It's impossible, well, but impossible, to communicate personas well within your organization without giving them a name. And yeah, sometimes the name is funny, but at the end of the day, it gives us an opportunity to really identify someone personally, uh, you know, with, with an actual with an actual name. We then get more specific with some real details. You see that this persona that uh, Ferguson had done uh, in their organization, we understand occupation, we understand what role they have, we understand home versus work, we understand some of this person's triggers and behaviors, we understand their technographics, pain points, what they do in their day, how our organization fits in their day. You can see that they've used not just, and I think this is a great example because they've used not just one visual to depict this person, but a series of visuals to actually illustrate the whole of their environment and what they're marketing to and what's meaningful to this person. And, you know, sort of a, a multifaceted Venn diagram here that they've put together to really illustrate how all of this stuff works together in the interplay of this business buyer, you can see they're talking about home life. They're talking about, you know, quotes. They're talking about not just the business behavior, but the holistic perspective on this individual. And that's really what the persona is designed to do when we get down to the details. Remember, people buy market segments don't. So we do want to get down to the level of as personal, as reasonable in this case, in as much as it's going to be meaningful to our organization, we want to get personal. So product service category quotes, frequency of use, and then again, you've seen a few different examples throughout uh, throughout today. None of them is meant to be your ideal template. You're seeing some common threads, uh, but you really can't template this stuff. We do need to consider other things that, that might be important to us. You know, in some cases it might be, are they indoors or outdoors? In some cases it might be geography. You don't see that in this particular profile uh, or this particular persona. Um, you know, so anything that's going to help to infuse understanding in your organization of, of who the personas are, uh, you know, are things that you need to add. You know, let's get a little bit more specific on personas. When we think about how this looks, we typically create anywhere from in a social media case, we might just create a simple paragraph narrative with a photo. Very simple, very straightforward, but it helps us to write for this individual. Uh, and at the end of, uh, you know, at the end of that process, that's all that's needed for the organization. That's fine. Ideally, we've gotten a little bit more involved, uh, but in some cases, that's sufficient. Fictional details, outline, environments, goals. And again, as we're talking about templates and models, and we'll see another one here in a second, it doesn't mean that we need to use one or the other of these templates in order to really you know, build our persona. So here's an example, and this actually comes out of um, a short but interesting uh, book on personas. Uh, by Michael Gosp uh, called Persona is a Guidebook on How to Build a Persona. And I do say short because it is very, uh, very, very short, uh, you know, very thin book. Um, and it's not complete uh, in, in terms of this whole process. So it's, it's one of the things we've used uh, to help influence and to help educate on this, uh, you know, when we, when we work with folks on this. But we, uh, you know, there are a few other resources that you should consider uh, in addition to this. But as an example. Uh, his generic persona template, name, education, title, uh, attitude. Attitude is something that you don't see in every persona. He typically puts it in because we do want to understand sort of their, their core, you know, sort of their more of their person, more of their, you know, who are they, 
Uh, how do they really think? What language actually appeals to them? Uh, in the B2B context, we might want to understand their reputation. Uh, we might understand the reputation in the industry or in their company. Uh, you know, are we dealing with a person who, you know, like before we talked about going to the C level or or really considering the focus of power and dissatisfaction and influence and so on and so forth? You know, where is this person? What is their specific role in the organization, in the decision process? You know, in the in the bigger picture of what we're trying to do. Uh, Michael likes to look at things like value and fear. What do they value? What are the things that are, you know, immovable objects for them or, you know, absolutely, you know, immutable flaws for them, if you will? They look at things that keep them up at night, so to speak, things they're afraid of, things we might need to mitigate as an organization. They don't like dealing with, you know, solo providers. They don't like dealing with organizations that haven't been around for 100 years, so on and so forth. Um, where do they get information? How do they educate themselves and all that stuff? So this is, again, a great template, a great approach, but it's not necessarily going to be the be-all, end-all. So we've done the personas. And like I said when we started, you know, giving us, uh, you know, 50, uh, 58 minutes all in on a, on a webinar to talk about the, uh, you know, the, the whole persona process does not make any of us, you know, experts in this, uh, you know, in this discipline. Uh, but in general, you know, if we follow these guidelines and, and bring a couple of other resources to bear, uh, you know, we're going to end up in pretty good shape. So on the home stretch here, once we've created the personas, and again, you've seen a few examples of full-on created personas, what they look like, and how an organization might use them, now we need to communicate them. And, and this is really a convergence of two factors. One is the personas are done, we've got to use them. But two, this is where that executive support that we secured early on, we really need to bring in that executive support here to make sure that as we're communicating the personas out to the field, customer service, or any of the other titles and departments you see listed here, that they understand the gravity of the situation and what they need to do with the personas, which is the next thing we need to communicate. What do they need to do with these things? So. Do we want them to use them in, in the case of social media as really an object uh, that, we're, that we're viewing and, and, and visualizing when we're writing content? Do we want them to use these as tools in the sales process to understand or categorize or classify the, the buyer before they meet with them and, and thusly assemble the right tools, language, and resources uh, and establish the rapport? Uh, how should we use them in the various aspects of the business? How does this influence the communication process? How does it influence the sales process? How does it influence any customer service or other outreach? How does it influence our dealers or distributors if we have two and three tier distribution uh, models? When should we use them? How do we integrate them into our day? Is it something that you know everyone gets a you know little deck of personas or you know little baseball cards and so on and so forth uh, you know so that we can actually create the uh, you know the, the usage habit within our own organization. So all of these things are part of what we need to communicate in the process uh, of personas when we're, uh, you know, when we're ready to, uh, to go here. Uh, the last couple bits, and then we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll look at a couple of questions here that, that folks have asked during this uh, process, uh, is really to go forward with this. You know, we, we, we ideally, the process of personas is used to explore and understand the customer's or the constituents we serve at a much deeper level than we ever have before. And it really gets at our goal of understanding behavior and understanding their goals. We want to understand the goals of the buyer uh, and understand how their behavior is evolving. If we answer the questions, you know, what are the goals of our constituents as it relates to our product service or organization, and what do we know now about their behavior and how it's changed since we've really last encountered them or first encountered them? Uh, those are two questions that are definitely, uh, the answers to those are, are, are worth having and worth going through the persona process to get to. Uh, we also want to understand a little bit from the persona process where people are headed. You know, what sort of changes can we see? Again, we're not asking them to predict the future. Um, we absolutely are looking to them uh, to, uh, you know, to sort of inform our decisions about, you know, what's, uh, you know, what's next. So what is next for, for all of us? I can't stress enough that 
while I hope you guys have gained a few things uh, during the webinar today and, and, and you know, opened, uh, opened up some possibilities perhaps for the organization now understanding a bit more about what's involved in personas and some of the value and a couple of, you know, quick stories and, and, and cases as we've gone through here. Uh, it's really, really impossible to learn enough about personas in the context of what we've done today. Uh, you know, this is a topic that we've been reading and researching on for years, uh, really a decade actually. Uh, and uh, at the end of, uh, you know, at the end of 2012, we came into 2013 saying, you know, uh, I think we're finally ready to put on a webinar based on some of the things we've learned. Uh, but it is a process that takes some time to really understand uh, and, and really facilitate. And there, again, there are a lot of good resources out there. Uh, your core team, you know, and one of the questions uh, that was asked here during the webinars, you know, how do you go about asking people to, to participate in the process? Uh, how do you get them to participate in some of these persona definition meetings, which is a great question. And, and the way I'd answer that is the score team are, are really those people that you see as the, the consummate stewards of the organization. And, and ideally, we look at them uh, as those people that have some direct touch with the customer, ideally, or have a vested interest in that. Um, you know, but stewards of the company, maybe they're folks that have been there the longest. Maybe they're people that just, you know, exhibit a real, you know, inherent care for the customer. Uh, but those three to five people that are going to be on the core team here are really responsible, and it does include one executive, typically a CMO or a COO, uh, not often the CEO, but some other C or EVP level type person, um, your VP, depending on the structure and, and hierarchy in your, your organization. Uh, really getting those folks on board or one of those people on board is important as well because they need to see this whole thing uh, through its entire life cycle. Uh, you know, and continue to, uh, you know, to keep the executive team bought into and just aware of what's going on. Uh, so, you know, anything else that, uh, you know, that you've done in the past, any sort of enterprise level change, whether it's ERP or Lean or Six Sigma or anything there, you think about how you pull those teams together and their criteria we use, um, you know, kind of look at some of those same criteria for assembling the uh, the core team for personas. Uh, and then finally, building plan, getting my, you know, here's the process, here's what we're going to do. Uh, one of the questions that's often asked is, how long does this stuff take? Uh, you know, most persona development uh, tends to take, uh, you know, some of the, uh, you know, some of the better part of a quarter, if you will. Uh, you know, when we think about getting uh, everyone, you know, involved here, uh, this can take more than, you know, it's going to take more than a month, uh, any more than six months, and we start to really lose, uh, you know, lose the opportunity for impact. Uh, so the last couple bits here. The, uh, the few resources that, uh, that we recommend and, and the few resources that, that heavily influence, you know, our perspective on personas, uh, you know, is The User is Always Right, uh, which is Steve Mulder, great book. Uh, you know, wonderful resource on personas. It's a little bit, a uh, little bit heavy on the tech perspective, on the tech side of things. Nonetheless, it's great foundational material. The Essential Persona Lifecycle is also a wonderful resource. Good book, full featured, tells you everything you need to know. But this is where, that for example, that concept early on of building your family and family planning and building your team, uh, your core team came from. Uh, the family planning concept in here is is interesting. They they use a lot of their own uh, vocabulary and, and concepts uh, in the process, so uh, it's very helpful. It's it's great to uh, you know it's 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 great to understand uh, you know how they perceive things. But again, it's it wouldn't be the only book I'd read on personas, and certainly the last one, uh, the marketing high ground series on personas um, uh, by Michael Gosp. Uh, again, this is the very thin book. Wouldn't be the only one I'd read, but it's a great resource as well. Uh, you know, one of the other questions, so just let's look at a couple of things that you guys had, uh, had asked here. You know, would focus groups help in defining personas? Yeah, absolutely. Focus groups are one part of the, you know, the, the research component that goes into it. But, you know, certainly those, uh, you know, those, those in-person interviews are really the most, uh, you know, critical uh, as well. Uh, you know, one of the questions that was asked is, is also, you know, what's in it for me? Uh, and, and I think the, the the what's in it for me, you know, uh, I'm thinking about that from the organization's perspective, and I think that comes from some of the benefits we talked about, easier to communicate with buyers, uh, shortening some of the, uh, you know, the actual sales cycles and things like that by truly understanding behavior 
uh, you know, is, is really critical. So I want to thank you guys today very much for, uh, for joining. I hope uh, we've all gained a, a little bit of insight about personas now and uh, have some, uh, some idea of uh, where we might go next or how we might augment the process that we're, uh, you know, we're already uh, on uh, or path that we're already on. Uh, of course, the slides will be out there uh, by this time tomorrow, so uh, the webinar is recorded and you will see the recording out there. Feel free to share with colleagues in the organization uh, if you so choose. And then uh, keep an eye on the email, website, and Twitter for the April webinar announcement. We've got some uh, really cool stuff coming up in April on the subject of human social media again, so we're going to kind of continue uh, this path. And then we're going to shift gears starting in May and June. Uh, we're going to bring in a couple of guests on uh, thought leadership, uh, really, uh, you know, sort of raising the bar a bit on thought leadership and the uh, discussion there starting May and then probably into June and July. So uh, thanks again, and uh, have a great Easter, everyone.